Hello everyone. Welcome to another Peaceful Solution Character Education Certification course. Everyone can be seated in the auditorium. Welcome to all of you that are watching online from many different countries. Um, once again, welcome to all of you, especially those of you. Um, we know many gathering in Africa, Brazil, Mexico, Colombia, um, Europe, all around the world. And it's always an honor to have you as our guest here at the Peaceful Solution Headquarters, along with everyone that is here um, joining us today live from the auditorium. And once again, we're going to continue along in the responsibility unit. And this is a great time of year to uh, be in the section we're at. We're going to close out Chapter 6 tonight. And then Chapter 7, uh, we'll get into that after we finish Chapter 6. But it gets right into what we see taking place, especially here in the United States, with tornadoes, hurricanes. We'll talk about terrorism. We'll get into all kinds of stuff. Um, but, of course, Chapter 6, being Responsibility in Society... That really ties hand in hand with all of the things I just mentioned. And you might think, well, tornadoes, hurricanes? Well, if you go back and remember Chapter 7 of the Self-Control Unit and what we talked about how our actions affect the microbes and the environment, then you'll start putting these things together on how we can contribute to destruction and devastation. We see it all the time in the oceans. And, but we're going to get to all of that. But we're going to conclude Chapter 6 tonight with what I've learned and of course, if everyone will turn over to Lesson Plan 6, page D, it's right beside page 99. It's one of the last grade tab pages. It is the last grade tab page for Chapter 6. And we're going to go through the last procedure, and it tells us to conclude the lesson by telling students that in order to educate society on the value of moral responsibility, we must begin by educating every person. And... Who does that person start with? And of course, it's ourself. That's exactly. I see people pointing to themselves. They're exactly right. You know, most people, no, oh, no, him, him. Yeah, if he would change, I'd do better myself. And that's not really true. You know, uh, it's, we went through that in the respect unit. And when we were traveling, going to schools, there were a lot of posters that were put out by other organizations, um, for-profit organizations. And they were actually saying respect. You got to give respect to get respect. And, of course, when you start playing this game of getting and getting, I would hate for someone to measure how much respect I have to give them before they respect me. Because some people might set a very high bar that you might not ever be able to reach. And, of course, everyone deserves respect. And all of these things must go hand in hand. But it begins with ourselves. Self-respect, being responsible, developing self-control. All of these things... We're affected by other people, but we have to control, as we read about last class, and we'll read about it again tonight, we really have to be the ones that control what we allow into our lives and how we're influenced and the peer pressure and the conformity and all of these things that have the ability to influence us, to change the way we think, feel, and act to the point that it can, even al it can alter our uh, values. And those are the things that we deem to be important. And moral responsibility, moral character in general, should be important to every person. It's not necessarily always that way, though. You know, sometimes, uh, what is the saying, stolen sugar tastes sweeter? Um, not for sure how. I'd hate to look over my shoulder every day because I stole the sugar. Well, have students read the section entitled, What I Have Learned, on page 116. Emphasize that crime will no longer plague society when everyone learns that we have a responsibility to treat others morally. And of course, remember morals or rules, turning over here to page 116, morals or rules, and that means we have to start accepting there's rules and guidelines that govern society. Now, there are a lot of rules and guidelines you kind of scratch your head about. Every year, at the end of the year, you'll have cities uh, in some states, they'll put out, here's a rule that we're abolishing. You know, this rule was created, or this law was created in 1875. And therefore, we see that it has no use anymore. But then there's some rules that, this is a rule, it's not really a law, but it's a rule that we keep here in the United States, and other nations think we're absolutely insane for doing it. And that's when we turn our clocks ahead in the spring and turn them back in the fall. They actually will, what, what, what's the benefit? Well, the sun goes down at 9 p.m. in the summertime. I kind of like that myself. I enjoy it. But a lot of these people, when you live in other areas, the sun goes down the same time every day. 
it's you know 5 30 5 45 or 6 o'clock and they're used to that they're used to the sun coming up 5 45 sun going down at 6 p.m and they think we're absolutely nuts that we change our clocks well then they ask well why why do you do it well somebody's responsible for it but no one can explain it even congress is still arguing over why we do it but we're talking about laws of morality these are things that keep us safe you know and I, and these are things that are there to protect us uh, prevent harm, prevent disease, um, to prevent theft, to prevent people from hurting in general. And one thing I want you to do, and this is not part of our class tonight, but I want you to do this. Um, we have such technology in this world today. You can see anything and everything. But I want you to take time to go through. We had a class this, uh, this last Monday with a group of students. Uh, covering the book that we'll go into next. And we were looking at how our actions affect other people and how we're responsible for the things that take place in society, whether they're beneficial or whether they're not, whether they're harmful or whether they're helpful. But I want you to take time to look through places like Yemen, southern Sudan, Sudan, Somalia. Go through and see what's taking place in places like Kenya, Nigeria, Malawi, Sierra Leone. Look at how people are suffering in Ecuador. Look at what's taking place with the rampage of taking advantage of people in Colombia and Venezuela. Take a look at what's going through and why people are searching and fleeing countries to find a better way. Everybody's searching for a better way. But if you'll just spend some time researching, you'll find out we're a society that tries to take advantage of everybody we can. And sadly, um, nations, not just individuals, nations are plundering other nations. The things that we see nations doing, you and I would go to prison for. Could you imagine going over to your next door neighbor's house and just go steal a couple cans of gas? They're going to call the police department. And they're going to come talk to you about it. Hey, you know, you might get a warning the first time. And then go back and steal his gas again. Or tap into his propane and run his propane tank over into your house. Now think, what would get done about that? Then why do we say it's okay for nations to go into other nations and just steal their oil? Why is it okay for nations to go into other nations and pillage their women? Slaughter their citizens? drop bombs that destroy houses imagine just go do some vandalism bust out some windows you're going to go to jail but you can go destroy whole cities and that's to move society forward so the main point in what i'm saying and what we're going to rehearse tonight is on a global scale we're doing a very horrible job of being a responsible society and yes, there are a few leaders that make these decisions for many people. And, you know, contrary to popular belief, everybody's always shocked when they say, well, you voted the president in. No, the citizens don't vote for the president of the United States. That's Congress's job, not ours. We don't get to do that. We just get the most popular vote has fallen by the wayside a few times in the last 20 years. So even a lot of, I'm amazed at how many Americans don't even know that. It's kind of shocking. But part of being responsible is understanding the rules that govern us. So think about these things as we go through this here on page 116 with starting out with although technology has increased by leaps and bounds, morally responsible behavior has not increased at the same rate. In fact, it has decreased, honestly. Looking back over to page 99, that was the very first page, the introduction we read. And think about the technological advances. The one thing that I really like about these books. These books came out before social media. So there's a lot of things that we have to tie into with influences and peer pressure and conformity that didn't really exist at this time. In fact, uh, we're getting ready to give ourselves away here. I know this was read before, but this shows how uh, kind of dated some of our information is, but it's still very valuable information because it relates to people we teach and it, it helps people connect. But here in the second paragraph, well, let's, let's start with the very first one and just read the whole thing. It says, wherever you see things accomplished and progress is made, someone has been responsible. 
Do you ever wonder who took the responsibility to build and develop roads, schools, stores, and all the other buildings and services that we have grown accustomed to? Well, when you think about it, it was done with community effort. Here in the United States, the WPA went forth through a lot of jobs that were created through taxing of people, and tax dollars have led to the infrastructure. At least, that's what it did back in those days. It's led to a lot of other things, but it did lead to the creation of the infrastructure. You know, a lot of people aren't really familiar with how the interstate system we have here in the United States was a great system, wonderful road system. Um, really hasn't been around that long when you look back, as the author would say, just 110, 115 years ago, it was, it was horses and uh, wagons. But here it says, within the last 50 years, our society has been responsible for inventing and producing many technological advances. Although 50 years ago might seem like ancient times to you, um, to me it doesn't because I was born 50 years ago, so it, uh, it used to sound old, but not now. It really wasn't that long ago. In fact, most of your grandparents and some of your teachers will tell you that 50 years ago seems like yesterday to them. 50 years ago, television was just invented and it was only black and white. There were no personal computers, video games, microwave ovens, Walkmans, and for those of you that don't know what a Walkman is, you can look it up, you know, <laughs> you can Google it and see a picture of it. You put a cassette tape in it, which uh, most children don't even know what that is, and don't even dare mention an 8-track tape. Uh, CD players or even CDs. Um, and I'm amazed that children today don't even know what CDs are. They know it as MP3s. So it makes me feel really old when I hear some people talk. And that's only a few things that were developed that were not developed yet. Now, although we live in a society where techno, uh, technology is increasing by leaps and bounds, is our moral responsibility to each other increasing at the same rate? Well, so where we're having this develop, are we actually being morally responsible and cre increasing at the same rate? Now, we're talking about for the benefit. Are we increasing in ways to be detrimental? I mean, think about it. As a society, you can go online. Used to, when I was in school, you would write pen pal letters. And that was the most exciting thing to get a pen pal letter back. We wrote to the UK. And you would send stamps back and forth. And it was always interesting. You know, you always wanted to get money, but they told you you can't send money through pay, you know, pen pals. That was considered illegal. Um, but you always wanted to have foreign currency just to see what it looked like. And that's still one of my interests today. Everywhere I go, I always come back with foreign currency because it's very interesting to me how different societies do things differently. But you always wanted to get a stamp or something. And it, it kind of gave you insight. You wanted to see what was it like for other people. And I remember being very young wanting to understand what it's like to live in England or what it's like to live in France or, you know, because it was really Europe that was pushed. And one thing that I've thoroughly enjoyed is being able to travel the world doing the Peaceful Solution. And one of the most shocking things that I've seen is life is so different from country to country. I mean drastically different. Now, I've been a lot of places in the United States along with William, David, and Catan. We've been to Washington, D.C. and Chicago. And we've been to the big cities and the small cities. We've been to the borders. And we've been all over the, all over the United States. And even in that, life is very different. Life in Chicago is very different than a child that lives in Abilene, Texas. Very, very different. In Abilene, Texas, you don't have to worry about walking down a certain street and being the wrong color of skin or having the wrong bandana in your pocket or not being with the right gang and you get shot. In Chicago, they told us very clearly, don't go two blocks past that. Don't go five blocks past this. Make sure you stay in this area. Why? Because they will shoot you. You're the wrong color of skin. You don't do that around here. And it's like, oh, okay. But in that saying, people are being identified, and I'm not faulting the people that are aggressive, because why were people aggressive? Remember, hate is taught. So if I go somewhere because of my skin, and I'm white, and people would physically harm you, makes me wonder, what did people do to them? What took place? Because this is not a normal thing. These people were not born this way. And it's the same way down south. I grew up in the south, and I've seen where people hang ropes from trees. And they point signs, and they say, hang out for, and they'll use certain words. And I'm glad when I was raised, I was taught that that, that right there is one of the greatest signs of stupidity. And 
I know some people might uh, feel offended that if we call racism stupidity, but that's exactly what it is. And yes, I came from the Deep South. I know what it's about, and it's stupidity. It's hatred without a cause. But sadly, racism used to be, it was a black and white thing. Not anymore. It can be, well, Middle Eastern. You can be Hispanic. You can be European. There's a reason to hate everybody. Asians, they were just beating them up here in uh, New York not long ago. Well, with these technological advances we have, we can connect with everyone around the world. You can have a conversation with anyone around the world. You can even speak a different language, and Skype will translate it for you. You know, you can speak English, and when they hear it, it comes out in Spanish or Portuguese or whatever language you select. And you can literally just connect with people. This kind of like what the UN does right now. And I remember the author of The Peaceful Solution talking about how these translating boxes have made it where everyone can learn the peaceful solution. You can teach it, and it comes out in a different language. Those are the benefits. But also look at what have we done with technological advances in warfare. That's where the majority of money has been spent. That's where a lot of effort has been spent. You know, not being the betterment for society, but actually being able to become a better thief, be a better tyrant, be able to control people a little bit better. Why do we do these things? You know, why do we why do we teach hate and why do we teach hate and then say war is a must? If we didn't teach hate, we could get rid of war. But we have to quit teaching hate first. Very fundamental basics. But we spend a lot of money on technology. Continuing here, it says, do we treat others with compassion or do we make irresponsible choices that jeopardize the lives and safety of others? You can be the judge. <clears throat> yeah, you actually get to be the judge this time. You can sit back and look. And that's why I'm telling everybody, sit back and look at what's going on in society today. How can one society spend an a billion dollars on a presidential election? One billion dollars to fill you full of lies about someone else. And, and we all have to admit, it doesn't matter who's running for what, these things are usually, uh, the, the stories that are told are not the absolute truth. There's a little bit of truth mixed with a little bit of bad. And no one's going to, if I was running for president and, you know, John over here is running for president, you know, in today's society, everything I have to say about John is going to be negative. I won't be able to think of one positive thing about John. You know, and that's what takes place. It's just a trash down. It's a beating. It's... It's remember what we said in the character unit, and we're responsible for this. That verbal abuse is just as bad. And, of course, there's some people we hold to higher standards and we expect more from them. And then when they mess up, we push them down a little bit harder. Now, leaders should be more responsible in a society, but we have to learn that you shouldn't hang out everybody's dirty laundry. Everybody in here has made a bad choice and a mistake. Could you imagine if you were running to lead someone, let's say for the peaceful solution, you're going somewhere to lead a country with a peaceful solution, and all they want to do is bring out everything that you've ever done that was bad that they can find from the time you were born till now. You know, oh, that man spent 15 years in prison. Well, he did. Did you leave out the fact that he's out of prison now and he's taught thousands of students? I've never been to prison. I've been to teach. But I can tell you what, some of the best teachers I know in the Peaceful Solution are former inmates from prison. And they do extremely well, and they can connect with people in a way that nobody else can. I've seen it for myself. I've taught in prisons, and I've seen teachers from the Peaceful Solution who became responsible citizens after someone taught them how to become a responsible citizen, and they can connect with other inmates in a way that no one else can. I can't because I've never been to a prison, so I cannot make that complete connection that they can. They can empathize. They know what it's like to be in solitary confinement. They know what it's like to be housed and to be treated certain ways. And to be told for 15 and 20 years on end, you're not going anywhere. This is your home. This is your yard. This is your house. And this is how it goes. They've lived it. You know, I've never lived that. And there's other things that other people live in other countries that are watching right now. They live things, too, that you can't imagine. You know, right now we have fans blowing in the auditorium because it's it's pretty warm. You know, today's a cool day in Texas. For you know, it's not 100 degrees, so it's not bad. But imagine living in a place where it's always 95 to 100 degrees, and people can't even afford to run a fan. 
they can't afford the electric bill for a fan. Don't even think about an air conditioner. That's way too far gone conclusion. But that's, that's a lot of society. And educate yourself because when we're irresponsible, when we're irresponsible for the things we've been given, which are really, you know, some people will call them blessings, but they're, they're positive attributes that were allotted here in the United States. We should be very thankful and realize not everyone has those things. And what can we do to better society? Not keep raping countries for their oil, pillaging their citizens, and, and all of these other things that we do. You know, because working hand in hand, this is how it goes. Well, you can be the judge. Go look. See what's taking place as we explore this chapter as to whether or not we live in a morally responsible society. By now, you should have an idea whether we do or not. You notice here at the bottom of the page it says, The all-over trend in all forms of crime has been upward since 1945. Do you remember anything else that took place in the 40s that took off with a boom? <laughs> you know? China, uh, Japan, to this day, still talks about how destructive it was, how they were mutilated back in the 40s, you know, but that's when the that's when the industrial boom of the United States took place. That's when, through the dropping of a bomb, they became a superpower. We, as a nation, became a superpower, and we became a superpower not by helping countries, not by supporting life, but by doing the most destructive act that had ever been done that mankind could see. There's a lot of horrible things that have taken place through history, but we have this on camera where we can still see it to this day. There are people still alive that give testimony. You know, there's documentaries, uh, White Light, Black Rain, things like that, that explain the horror these people went through. And you know what? Did we learn as a society? No, we're trying to do it again right now. You know, we see it every day. So think about this technological advances and how it's increased and have we gotten better or have we gotten worse. Then look back over to page 116 to cover the second bullet point. And it says, moral responsibility in society is measured by the rate of crime and number of arrests. Now, moral responsibility in society. Now, this is it's very key that we understand this. The moral responsibility in society is measured by the rate of crime and, and number of arrests. That's people that aren't keeping the rules you can pretty much get an idea of how the rules are not even being taught also. So the failure isn't when the crime is committed, the failure is when the teaching of the rule never took place. When you live in a society that wants to say, oh, the laws? We did away with those things. We don't know, you can steal, it's okay. I don't know anybody thinks it's okay except the thief and the thief doesn't even like to be stolen from. You know, and I realize we have a lot of laws here in the United States. They're enormous. I mean, if you've ever been to the Library of Congress, there's books like this thick, and they're just all the way down through there. You know, uh, just try to figure out the tax code. If you can do that, you've worked a miracle in yourself, you know. But moral responsibility. Do not bring harm to yourself, someone else, or the environment. We're talking about very simplistic things here. You don't have to complicate it. Very simplistic things. Um, these are things that we measure this crime of how well we're doing. Well, looking over here to page 100. And there's a couple things we're going to tie in with the next three bullet points. So we'll read through it and we'll connect them all together. But looking here at page uh, 100, the second paragraph, it says, Remember, morally responsible people are, considered, are considerate and compassionate. Uh, they use discipline and self-control to make choices that demonstrate respect for themselves and others. They are people of integrity. There are many people in society who are morally responsible to others. But looking back up at the very top, it says, One way to determine if individuals in a society are morally responsible for each other is to examine the rate of crime in that society. The whole point about this, reading the second paragraph first, is we do have people that are morally responsible, but we need more. Because when the rate of crime is going up, that means the rate of teaching people to be morally responsible is not there. Notice, crime is defined as a grave or serious offense, especially against morality. Crimes such as burglary, rape, murder, and assault, uh, to be physically aggressive, are examples of ways people are morally irresponsible to each other. And, you know, 
in society, we like to take people that commit serious crimes, whether it be uh, rape, which is a horrible thing to do to someone, um, murder, you know, that's, that's a choice you can't undo. Uh, you know, there's other things people do to affect children that really mess with them mentally that is uh, almost next to impossible to fix. But when you go back, there was a... That I, you know, myself and, and, and William, we, had, we have close friends that we work with all the time. And we've dealt with people that have committed some really, really, really bad crimes in their life. I mean really bad crimes. And one thing that... Um, there's quite a few of them we talked to. And some of them committed these crimes around 17, 18, 19 years old. And I'm talking about as bad as you can imagine. It's pretty much there. And one thing that they all do is they all try to understand why they did it because for the life of them, they cannot figure out why they made that choice. After they start becoming educated and the mindset of what they were taught to be, once they start becoming educated and they start learning this is how you do things, their greatest, most confusing thing is trying to figure out why did I do that? But you know what? 35 years later, they're still sitting in a prison cell why did I do that? Because society doesn't forgive. They're still locked up, rotting away. You know, and it's a horrible thing to see. But there's people in society that, you know what? If somebody did this to my child, throw the switch. That's it. Kill them. But let one of their family members do it to somebody that they care about. And it's, oh, well, you know, you don't understand what he went through in life now. You know, he went through some hard things. So it, it's expected that he did this. Well, believe it or not, that kind of works for everybody. And there's some people that are just generally negative people that don't care. You know, they were taught not to care. A lot of hard work went into making people not care. But when we start measuring this crime rate and the moral responsibility, you know, I would, one thing that the author of the Peace of Solution told us a long time ago, he said, always take note of the teachers that knock the rules, say the rules aren't there. Don't worry about those rules, you know. The rules are there to keep you safe. But when people go, ah, no, 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 that rule's okay. We'll, we'll, we can bend it. Bend it, but don't break it. That's what we do here. Bend, but don't break. Or we'll ignore that one this time. You know, almost like, well, you didn't cut your finger off this time with the saw, but next time when you cut your finger off, okay, then we're going to have to adhere to the rule, okay? Safety will be an issue at that point. No, rules are there to keep us safe. And I want you to think as a teacher, tell me at what time can you get rid of the rule and not have the consequence? When can you take the rules, throw them away, and not expect the consequence? It does not exist. For every action, there's a reaction. And if nothing harmful came from breaking the rule, there would be no rule that says don't do it. It would be okay. There's a reason there's a rule there. And when you don't keep that rule, it just it's like a snowball going down the hill. It gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger to the point you have to make a decision. Do we just accept that breaking the rules are okay now? Or do we have to continually teach why the rules are beneficial? Doesn't mean you can change someone who's breaking the rule, but we have to continually teach why the rules are beneficial. Even to ourselves, we need that too. Because with this rate of crime going up and the number of arrests, that doesn't, that doesn't promote success. Um, look back to page 116, because we're going to tie in the next one also. Um, and then we're going to go back to page 8 also and see what we read before. And it says, A high rate of crime indicates that as a society, many people do not value having positive moral character. Now, also, I want you to think about this. Measure crime. What is a crime? A theft, vandalism, you know, um, kidnapping is a crime. We don't think about that when a 17-year-old sneaks out and gets with some other 17-year-old. Oh, that wasn't kidnapping. <laughs> really? Yeah, that's what we call it. It's kidnapping. You know, just because they did it together, well, they're not even adults yet. You know, and here they are running around. Uh, think about it. Think about what people do. And think about how society is, ah, they're young. They'll grow out of it. Don't worry about it. It's okay. They really, really, they grow out of it. Society shows we're not growing out of it. Late, latest study that just came out about sexually transmitted diseases, 20 million new STDs a day. That, and it's going up. It's been that way for a while, but 20 million a day new STDs. Okay, if um, I have a question for you to ponder. 
if you do something and something bad occurs to you because you did it, is that a consequence for breaking a rule? And then think about our blood supply here in the United States where they no longer test for HIV blood. It's, it's actually offered out now. and They're doing it a different way. I remember a tennis player, a very popular tennis player named Arthur Ashe, who when he got HIV through a blood transfusion, it became big news. They named tennis stadiums after him, and, and, and people watched him die. They literally got to watch him die because he was doing tennis, and uh, he was a commentator, and he watched his health just deplete, and he got it from a blood transfusion. Think about how these decisions that we're promoting in a society, how they've killed millions of people already. And then think about if we're doing something and it causes harm, that's immoral. What actions are we doing that cause these things? Why do we need to do something differently? You know, why does the peaceful solution use the word premarital? Look at the people that are dying and suffering. Just look at the news. Look and see how people are hurting every day. Innocent people getting these things because other people bringing them home. Anytime there's something that hurts someone, it's immoral. And then don't just define crime by people that are, oh, well, he was convicted, therefore he's guilty. No, there's a lot of guilty people walking around society today. Probably 99.99999% are all guilty of something. I'll give the ones that were just born yesterday room for advancement because they haven't had room to do anything yet. But we've all done stuff that we have no way or rhyme or reason to look at other people and say, you know, I, I'm better than you. I, I did it better. Not really, you know. We might have had better choices, but by saying we did it better, what situations were we brought up into? Here, you know, there's a lot of children right now that have been taught peaceful solution from a very young age. Once again, responsibility and society. They have an advancement that children that aren't taught anything, children that are eating mud pies in Haiti right now, don't get. Is that a crime to know that we have people, citizens, eating mud pies while we're throwing food out in the ocean? Think about how we are as a society and the responsibility. I just don't want to. I know we talked a lot about crime and the rate of crime, but there's a lot of crime being committed we don't define as crime. But if we're doing something that could help somebody and we're just ignoring it because ah, that's, that's, that's Haiti, let them do what they're going to do. That's Sudan. We just want their oil. That's why we divided South Sudan and Sudan. You know, That's the only reason we do that. Think about what we do to take other people's things and how we would go to prison for it and then murder thousands of people just to get our way. But yet we justify that. Justified wars. That's the greatest crime, these justified wars. They're great crimes. Um, but looking back here, 116, so a high rate of crime indicates that as a society, many people do not have, many people do not value having positive moral character. Let's look back over to page 100 first. Um, we read that, but let's go to page, uh, or the bottom of that page, the bottom of that page. It says when the third paragraph, when people know that there is a thief in their neighborhood, they become fearful that their belongings will be stolen or their houses burglarized. They also make sure their doors are locked and uh, close all windows at night. Some people buy dogs to scare off would-be thieves and others spend thousands of dollars for security systems to protect their homes. Crime changes the quality of people's lives. And when you look over here, you had a situation where a counselor beat, set on fire, teen girls arrested. You know, these are girls. Most school shootings, I think we've had one that recently took place in the last two years with a girl that did a school shooting. Um, and now we have, you know, used to be all males, but it's not just males doing these things. We're not going to read through that article for time's sake, but that pulled in a lot of how these things are taking place. And I want you to look back to page eight. Page eight. Um, I'm pretty sure that's where it was at. Yes, page 8. And it's, it was entitled Shared Responsibilities because we're talking about society. And that's how we have to do things and we have to engage with each other. And I want to read the whole page just to put some things back into our mind that we've covered before, taking this and putting it in with society. It says, although we have different responsibilities, if everyone fulfills their duties as they are instructed, notice instructed, that means taught, 
we could create a world where we can rely on and trust others. So once again, if we're taught this, we can do this. Of course, some people have more responsibilities than others. A man with a family will have more responsibilities than his teenage son. A president will have the responsibility of taking care of his own family as well as citizens of his country. Regardless of how varied our duties are, there are some responsibilities that should be shared by all. Notice the very first one here. It says we are morally responsible to each other. That's something we must do. That's what we're talking about with being responsible to society. A morally a moral person, excuse me, a moral person is able to choose between right and wrong and is respectful of others. Now, that's one sentence there, but what has to take place for that to come to pass? A moral person is able to make a choice between right or wrong. Just in that right there, that means someone has to be taught the difference between right or wrong. Someone has to stand and tell you there are rules that bring consequences or rewards. Someone has to tell you you can't live your life breaking the rules and get by with it. Someone has to stand for the rules. Now, I don't mean be oppressive and, oh, you spilt that glass of milk, how dare you? Somebody, you know, some faraway land could have drank that. And, you know, I'm not talking about being uh, abusive. I'm talking about educating in a positive way. Um, tearing people down will never help someone. Negative criticism will never help a person. Um, but telling someone when we've done something wrong and pointing out how we can do it better, you know, that's not hatred. And that's not a negative thing. That's a positive thing. Continue on, it says... Um, if we would do this, teach how to make these respectful choices, he would never or she would never intentionally hurt others or steal from them. When we lack moral responsibility toward each other, society suffers. This is apparent by the high rate of crime, violence, and war within our world. Being morally responsible to each other, we can avoid the hatred and hostilities that lead to violence and war. Treating each other with respect by not being verbally or physically abusive are examples of being morally responsible. So once again, if we do things that are violent, that means we're morally irresponsible. Does anyone know of a war that's not violent? Can you think of any way to destroy, bomb, mutilate another nation and not cause violence? Now, I think everyone can agree that killing somebody is pretty negative. If you or I go into Abilene and we decide, or whatever city you live in, and you decide that you just want to kill somebody because, well, you know, they got something in their house I want it. I'm going to take it. I'm just going to, I'm just going to be the man. I'm just going to, I'm going to blow their car up and that's how we'll do it. And that's considered, oh, yeah, that's bad. That's, you're, you're a nutcase. You, you should be in a mental institution. But yet we do that as a government and it's, People, hurrah, we took him out. Think about the people that just celebrated the leader of Iran's death. You've seen them in many different countries. And one article I read, and I don't know anything about this man. I've read a lot about him. You don't believe everything you read on the news, you know, or on the internet, that's for sure. But the one thing that most agencies wrote about this man, they said that he stood on moral principle and he supported moral principle of his culture. In other words, um, there were things like a hijab. He was raised, and in that country, it's morally responsible to do that, to wear that. And I've met many people from the Middle East that, and people can say that I would never, as a woman, I would never wear that. No one should make me wear that. I'm not saying anyone should make you wear it. But if there are people who choose to wear it, and they're taught that it's an honor in their country, you shouldn't speak against it either. You should be morally responsible enough to accept they're not doing anything that hurts anyone. And I'll be honest with you, I would much rather go through the Middle East and to go through where people are covered than to go to some of the places here in the United States or other countries where people are walking around with almost nothing on. I find that to be very uncomfortable myself. You know, and where's the fine line at? And once again, before you criticize a nation that does that, do research on the, on the crime rate of rape in those countries compared to countries that do not practice modesty. And if you're allowed to go around half-dressed and your rape is 
astronomically high, you might want to go back and think, where did the problem start with? The problem didn't start with the crime that was committed. It started with the teaching that allowed the mind to get there. But we don't do that in society, you know, and I thought about that when I read those articles. That's one thing that stuck out because of the word moral. A lot of people said he stood on moral principle. Now, moral principle for his country and his culture might be a little bit different than others, but if that culture does something that doesn't bring harm to themselves, someone else, or the environment, then I'm to accept what it is they choose to do because they're not hurting anyone. And that's just a fact of life, and that's the way we should be. But continuing on here, it says, by being morally responsible to each other, we can avoid the hatred and hostility. That's once again, we can avoid that, that lead to violence and war. Then the second one here, the very last one, it says, we are responsible for our environment. That's something that William, in the next chapter, we're going to get into a lot. And I'm sure there's going to be throughout that chapter, you're going to have endless videos, resources, uh, because right now in the United States, tornadoes are at an all-time high. It is something like it's never been before. And that's what we're going to get into in the next chapter. But how did it get this way? Is it possible that we could be making choices that lead to our environment? You know, getting sick, so to speak. Remember the seventh chapter of the self-control unit? We spent almost a month and a half covering that. And I encourage everyone to go back and watch it. Because a lot of the things that we're going to talk about in that chapter... You got the foundational parts in the seventh chapter of the self-control unit. But here it says, we are responsible for our environment. This is the only planet in the universe that we can live on at this time. And I would dare say that tomorrow will be the same one, and the next day and, and the next few months will still be Earth. We're not going to be able to travel anywhere else. We rely on our planet Earth to sustain our lives. Yet every day we deplete the Earth of its natural resources and pollute the air, land, and seas. We went through the different ways how these things are polluted too. Just don't get greenhouse gases in your mind. There's a lot of choices that are made that make the environment sick. We talked about microbes and how the very smallest part um, of these have huge potential. Um, we'll get into that when, uh, and William might get into it, him or Katan will probably get into it, showing um, the force behind hurricanes and tornadoes and and it's not normal and it's not healthy and it's getting worse you know and there's reasons why and you'll learn that here in the peaceful solution we already brought it out in the in the respect or the uh, self-control unit um, the author of the peaceful solution was a huge teacher of these things the science scientists agree with him 100 percent it says our food sources are also polluted at this time Food and water contaminated by pollution have been known to cause serious disease within the human body. And if you buy bottled water and you see what's been on the news, there's millions of bottled water being called back right now. It's up, it's up to everyone to take responsibility for preserving and caring for our planet's natural resources. You know, natural resources are things we're supposed to use, enjoy. It's a benefit to us. You know, the earth... Um, the author of The Peaceful Solution gave a great class one time. It was a Peaceful Solution class. He was talking about how the earth is like a big manufacturing machine. It literally creates everything we need to enjoy life. But the one thing the earth needs, it needs some respect. If we start destroying the manufacturing that's taking place, the earth is like a sick man or sick woman. It can only do so much. And if we're not responsible for using things the way we should do them and treating things the way, you get disease spread. You know, just just look at these nations that get typhoid. Well, that's where the sewage wasn't processed properly. You can get salmonella through overrunning your food. There's just endless things that can take place. Right now in Europe, they have people that have, they call it the Ebola-looking fever, red-eye fever, because people are bleeding out of their eyes in Europe. And they say it looks a lot like Ebola. You know, well, where did it come from? Well, we don't know. Well, it started somewhere, you know, and I'm sure they'll blame a monkey or something, but, um, you know, blaming wildlife is never going to help us either. Looking back over to page 116, and remember, we have to be responsible, and the, the measurement of crime, and we're going to get into more of this, because a lot of these tied together as we're reading. Um, Taking these things and realizing it's a lack of education. That's what's leading to these things. Um, 
here in the fourth point, it says negative character traits such as greed, aggression, selfishness, and a lack of self-control, along with the lack of moral responsibility to others, can lead to crime. Can lead to crime. Once again, you can go back and pull a lot of that off page 100 that we've read. Um, also, going over to page 102 on the very bottom, there was some questions here about how crime affects lives. And it says, here's something to think about. If one crime could have so many negative consequences... How do you think 15 million crimes annually would affect society? Now, that was a question we were supposed to ponder. And then looking over to page 103, it says, Crimes have become so commonplace in our society that people have become desensitized to it and its effects. And when we get into the Building More Excellence Unit, which is the next unit, we're going to get deeper into what it means to be desensitized. But literally, it's just accepting the rule is just we're just going to break it. Yeah, don't worry about it. When you desensitize someone to breaking a rule, you've really helped become, one, you're a very irresponsible person yourself, and you've also helped society become worse. And is it a kind of a strong statement to say that when you avoid the application of rules, you're desensitizing people? What does it mean to desensitize? It means to get someone used to not being able to see there's a consequence for their choices. doesn't mean that you, can, you can't make anyone see see the consequence of their choices you can't make that take place but you can through education repeated education that's how we learn through repetition and it doesn't mean through yelling and screaming or beating but never giving up that you can one day get through to someone like i said i went through it with my driver's license and getting speeding tickets people were telling me the right things and i just oh, okay and it wasn't until I started losing all of my money paying so I could drive my car that it started affecting me mentally where it was like, man, this is, I'm working two weeks for State Farms who I'm working for. And that's what it got to. But you know what? Everybody told me the right things. And I still, until I finally suffered the consequence, and, you know, I was very thankful. I didn't lose my life. I didn't cost someone else their life. I just had to work, you know, it was from 16 to 21 before my insurance went down. And a lot of wasted time. I could have done a lot of other things at that time instead of that. But, I, you know, it was a hard lesson to learn, but at least um, it could have been much, much worse. But continuing on here, it says, In other words, people do not always react with shock, outrage, and disgust when they hear about crime. They just accept it as a normal way of life. And once again, what is a crime? A crime is breaking a rule. Well, why do we have rules? They're there to keep us safe. Well, what is a rule? You know, you um, there's a lot of rules that people laugh about. I remember I had a health advisor tell me one time, you really shouldn't be eating after 9.30. Look, I don't get home till late. And when I eat, you know, I eat, and I do a lot of overseas talking to people because people are getting out of bed. When we're going to bed, I'll go to bed at 1 o'clock, and I'm usually, I'll eat supper, you know, 9, 10, or somewhere around in there and go to bed. And I thought, ah, it's just, you know, it's just somebody's opinion. And then later on in life, when you start realizing, oh man, my body's out of whack. What occurred? You know, what do you mean I got high blood pressure? What do I have to do to do it? First thing they said, this is what everybody told me. And I talked to healthcare providers, natural uh, practitioners in three different countries. And every one of them said, are you insane for eating before you go to bed? And I'm like, oh, well, I should have listened to the first one, which was the smartest one, by the way. <laughs> um, but you think, of, you think that, nah, I can do it my way. It's not going to affect me. And when you change your life, everything else goes back the way it's supposed to be. And that's just a simple rule that you think, ah, nah, no big deal. Until you start seeing the effects it has on you and you realize, yeah, it's a big deal. Is it murder? Well, you're hurting yourself. You know, are you, are you respecting yourself? No. Well, this is the something that we're going to read right here just quickly. Look at these number of arrests, but I want you to look at these crimes. You know, drug abuse violations. Um, think of the fentanyl that comes across and the money that's being made, and there's still no headway in that. Driving under the influence. Um, I won't mention the uh, city official that was just arrested here in, the, uh, in Abilene for driving under the influence, and... They couldn't show up to court the next day, and they were supposed to try a case where somebody was driving under the influence. Well, they couldn't make it because they got arrested the night before for doing it. Am I trying to say anything bad about them? No. But I sure hope that causes them to have empathy and realize anyone can get caught into that. 
Um, you know, when you don't watch what you're doing, it's, it can be a bad thing. Assault. You know, think about assault. What, what is assault? Aggravated assault and assault is two different things in some states. Do you have to really, really call physically, bodily harm to someone? Now, I want you to think about this. If aggravated assault was really looked at as causing physically, body, bodily harm, then what would you classify when you go out and give someone an STD? Is that physical body harm, bodily harm, or is that just, uh, ah, it's just, I just get a shot and it goes away? Tell that to someone that got herpes or HPV. They don't have any shots to make it go away, and you, you've given it to them for life, to the point we've created rules with HIV. If you knowingly go around infecting people with HIV, it's a crime. You go to prison for it. Does it stop it? No, it hasn't stopped it at all. Then you have disorderly conduct, uh, drunkenness, which that usually falls into there, fraud. Um, there's some nations, I don't know if they could operate without fraud. And I'm sure there's somebody laughing right now that knows exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, weapons, carrying, possessing, etc. You know, and, and there's a lot of difference. Here in the state of Texas, perfectly legal to carry a gun. In fact, it's almost, you're almost a little like as breaking the law if you don't carry a gun in the state of Texas. And I'm not encouraging people. I'm just saying that's the way it feels in the state of Texas. If you don't have a gun when they pull you over, it's, well, son, what's wrong with you? You should have one somewhere in here. You know, you're, sp you're supposed to be a responsible citizen. And that's the Texas mentality. Um, but I go to other places where guns are extremely illegal, and the gun violence is much worse in the places that's illegal than it is in the state of Texas. But, of course, usually when people have these illegal weapons, they have military-grade stuff which was created to bring peace, right? Um, also, curfew and loitering law violations, people not getting home, doing things after, you know, getting in trouble, motor vehicle theft, goes along with fraud, <laughs> uh, sexual offenses. Um, once again, these things are defined, and we've brought out before in statistics about the sexual uh, issues that take place that really are never discussed. Then you have arson, and then murder and manslaughter. All of these things, of course, bringing society down. Uh, looking back over to page 116, uh, so we can get through the rest of these, uh, it says in the fifth one, society deals with criminals by imprisoning them as a means to stop crime, keeping society safe, and to rehabilitate. Looking over to page 105, um, you can look at the statistics for yourself to see how successful this is. And it says, historically, society, re society responds to criminals, excuse me, historically, society's response to criminals has been to incarcerate those who break the law in order to protect law-abiding citizens and reduce the number of crimes. Once a person is found guilty of crime, he or she can be placed in either jail or prison based on the seriousness of the crime and the duration of the sentence. Once again, what is not considered here? Education. Why did the crime take place? How did this take place? Where did it start? You know, so keep those things in mind. And then you see here the main purpose of prisons or jails is to protect society, prevent crime, and rehabilitate. And to this day, I think we have 2.2 million prisoners here in the United States. Um, and it's going up. And we've turned prisons into a business. So think about that. Are we really doing it to protect society, or are we doing it to make and generate income? If we really wanted to protect society, think about if you had prisoners inside of a prison facility, think of the unlimited education you could provide. But we don't do that. We don't do Some do. Some do allow education. The majority do not. That just entertainment is all they offer them. Looking back to page 116, it says also, or excuse me, although... Although prisoners deter some from also prisons deter some from committing more crimes, prisons in general do not successfully rehabilitate their inmate. Sixty five percent of inmates released from prison commit additional crimes and return to prison within a short period of time. Looking back to page one twelve again, of course that's called recidivism, where they're going in, coming out, going in, coming out, going in, coming out. Um, and, of course, it's this continual basis of how people are not being able to get this out of their life. They're not able to overcome it because they're not taught anything different. Um, and you read here on the second paragraph, it says, Prisons and jails 
are different. Gels are mainly used for short-term sentences of usually one year or less. They are also used to house people in protective custody and uh, juveniles who are waiting to be transferred to detention centers. Prisons, on the other hand, are for long-term offenders. They offer educational and vocational training. They should. I know of many prisons that don't, as well as counseling in an effort to help inmates change their lives. As of 1998, the United States, there were 93 federal prisons and 1,430 prisons. Going back over to page 107, you also see here that prison life in general is violent and unpredictable. Prisoners routinely abuse one another physically, verbally, and uh, emotionally, and sexually. The United States Correctional reported that there are over 30,000 inmate assaults on other inmates. There is a high rate of crime even within the prison. Inmates' belongings are routinely stolen. Some are forced to give up their belongings, such as soap, toilet paper, and food. In addition, sexually transmitted diseases, including HRV, are prevalent in prisons. Due to overcrowding, which exists in most U.S. prisons, prisoners are constantly being built to accommodate the ever-increasing number of convicted crimes. The overcrowded prisons and jails add to the violence and abuse that already exists. In an effort to re rehabilitate inmates, prisoners offer educational and vocational programs. A vocational program teaches skills related to job, specific job, or trade. Although these programs are available, only 20 to 25 percent of prisoners are motivated to actually um, use them. So once again, you have this uh, continual lack of education, not getting through, not getting into someone's uh, mindset to help change the hearts and minds. And, of course, on page 109, you can actually see about the juvenile delinquents. And once again, how you have a breakdown where it says young people who are morally irresponsible toward others and crimes committed also suffer the consequences of their actions. Those who break the law are called juvenile delinquents. But once again, it breaks down with teaching. And that's where we're really getting to here uh, in bullet point seven where it says education plays a major role in teaching people the value of obtaining positive character and being morally responsible toward each other. And looking over to page 114, we covered that. And once again, I encourage everyone, David did a great job covering that. He pulled in some videos and news articles, and he did a great job in bringing that in. But also for your notes, because I skipped over this, for your bullet point six um, for recidivism, I left out page going to page 112. I said it, but I didn't go to it. Page 112, um, and let me read that really quickly. It says, being in prison is not a walk in the park. Prison life is dangerous and unpredictable. Once a person serves time, you would also think he would have learned his lesson and dedicated himself to never committed another crime. The reality, however, is that 65% of those released from prison commit more crime and return to prisons within a short period of time. This is called recidivism, and it is an excellent way to measure how well the prison system is working in regards to rehabilitating inmates. Although 35% of inmates do not return to prison once they have served their time, 65% is too large a number to ignore. So once again, I said that for bullet point six, but I didn't turn to it and read it. So here on page 114, we're talking about education. And notice here it says education is the answer. The key word in the question is the word teach. Teach what? Teach the rules. Remember, responsibility is developed through instruction and practice. That's the key point to this. Through teaching, instruction, and practice, by studying the Peaceful Solution Character Education Program, you are learning the value of being responsible to yourself and others. In order to improve our society, each individual, including prisoners, must be taught to be responsible for his or her own thoughts, actions, and attitudes. Once again, it starts with the thought process because those thoughts lead to feelings and feelings lead to actions. Then looking back over to conclude tonight's class, uh, bullet point eight, if each individual values positive character and learns to be morally responsible toward others, we will have a morally responsible society. You know, and you can tie into how you are being influenced there on page 114, but also look over to page 115 and the first sentence there, well, let me... Start on the bottom, page 114, the very last paragraph. It says, it's up to you to be aware of how you're being influenced. Remember these things that could change the way you think, feel, and act. 
If you respond with violence to situations that upset you or anger you, recognize that this is not normal and could lead to you or someone else getting hurt. Make responsible choices in regards to managing your emotions. To manage your emotions, we're going to have to manage what we allow to come within our minds. Do not make the same mistake that so many others have made by being influenced to handle uh, frustrations with violence and aggression. By handling anger and frustration in nonviolent ways, you can keep yourself and others safe. Remember, we are all morally responsible to each other. And once again, if you don't have page 8 written there, I would write page 8 down because that's when we first went over that. We just repeated everything that was on page 8 in the last few pages. And the very bottom, once again, it says a solid education must include how to develop a positive character. In other words, there has to be a how-to program, how to get it done. And on page 116, just to read the last uh, quote here, it says, If you maintain a positive character and are morally responsible to others, you can make a difference in society. And that's something for all of us to acknowledge and realize that this is possible and of course, for those teachers to look, there's also some enrichment activities that you can use that will not be part of chapter seven. And there's a, quite a long story there, a letter that you can use to re, you know, rehearse some of the things for your class activities to be used. So our next class, uh, William's gonna get to start in chapter seven, uh, which you know will be a little bit of rehearsal chapter six. It will be June the 2nd, uh, this coming uh, Sunday at 5.30 p.m. So please bring your responsibility units and get ready to learn a lot about the environment and what we're seeing today. Thank you once again for joining us.